great. Mm. It's a scary space, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> um, Charlie, thanks very much for coming. No problem, I'm delighted to be here. Um, first question, um, I suppose is kind of the obvious one. Um, how does one become the Chief News Broadcaster for RTE? Um, by luck. Um, by effort. Um, I always say, because Shane, we were having a discussion um, upstairs, was having a cup of tea, and he asked me what college did I go to, and I told him that I never went to college. Um, I failed my intercert, I failed my leaving, and I was not fortunate enough uh, to be able to get to college. And in a way, I suppose I always regret it. Um, but the other side of that was that it had made me hungry. Uh, to try and do something for myself. And any time I meet people now, I'm going, I would say the same thing here is, um, never be put off um, by what might knock you back. I believe that people, if you have an inner core and inner strength, you can do what you want to do. Um, be it a hairdresser, be it a pilot, it doesn't matter, be it a plumber. If you really want to do something, go out and work your backside off to try and achieve that. And that's what I did. I say I use my fingernails to try and get into the business, first of all, of journalism. I started off by working in a, in a factory which made um, Hans cold cream. <laughs> you know what that is? So, and then shampoo. And then I went from there. So I worked really hard to get into journalism. I got in sort of by accident in a way. Uh, you know, when I was growing up in 1969, 1970, um, there was street agitation in Dublin. The north of Ireland was just happening. Um, so I just worked really hard. And um, I eventually made it to wherever I am now. But I always, I do believe the one thing that probably all careers uh, end, uh, if not in failure, they do begin to take a dive like that. I think the most important thing is, is to know when you've achieved the thing that you want to, and then to try and move on, and not to be afraid uh, to move on. I wish more politicians themselves would think uh, like that and move on before they're booted out. <laughs> so, same for me. What, what made you realise that journalism is what you wanted to do? Well, in a way, what, I'm going to answer this in reverse order, because in a way what shocked me and I'm um, hoping not, this is not going to be on YouTube, when that Charlie Bird says there's not enough street agitation. <laughs> um, but in a way, actually, can I'm, edit su that I'm surprised that more people are not out. When I came back from America 18 months ago, after all this, the country started to implode, I was surprised in a way that there wasn't more street agitation, that more and more people weren't out in the streets. Because I can remember the tax marches of the 70s in Dublin, and again, in the 80s, there was 100,000 people out protesting on the streets of Dublin over the tax situation. Absolutely enormous. Huge marches um, uh, at the time. And there was the same all over the country. So for me, in the late 60s, early 70s, I suppose uh, I had a bit of a social conscience. So I wanted to be out doing things. I, wouldn't, I didn't get to university. Uh, but so some of the people at the time, there were lots of student marches. And it wasn't just about fees, they were complaining about housing in Dublin at the time. There was the Dublin Housing Action Committee, a lot of social issues and things about what was, that was going on in the north of Ireland. And I got caught up in that. I got him, you know, I felt, let's be out there. And so that's why, in a sense, I, I joined a group called the Young Socialists. I joined the Labour Party. Um, I was into all of that type of thing because I wanted to be doing something. Uh, I felt it was important uh, to do something. And then, as I said, I had the lucky break to get into, first of all, I got into the Irish Times as a, basically as a librarian, as somebody working. And what I saw there was fantastic because I met the reporters, the photographers. I met, the, at the time, a man called Douglas Gagey, who was the editor of the Irish Times, a most remarkable man. Uh, his daughter, Susan Denham, is now the Chief Justice. And, uh, but this guy was incredible. So what was happening at the time was just brilliant in, 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 in the country. 
and I suppose that's how I just got involved. And then I, I moved into journalism, um, and a, I won the lotto uh, in May 1980. For me, it, getting to join the RT newsroom as a reporter in May 1980 was like winning the lotto, because it was an ambition which I couldn't believe. And um, it was fantastic. And I can remember to this day my first news report. And again, I'll tell the story because I'm not afraid to tell things like this. Um, I wasn't a particularly good speller. And when I joined the newsroom at first, I used to have carry around in my pocket a small little dictionary. And I was sent to do a report on the Irish Country Women's Association, their AGM. And I came back to the newsroom and I was told to prepare um, a report which would have been about 45 seconds long, which wasn't very, it wasn't long in that duration, but it was about 45 seconds of what they call a voiceover, so there were no interviews. But I was so scared. I went out into the corridor and I actually got out the dictionary because I can't remember the word that I couldn't spell or I thought that I couldn't spell, but I was so embarrassed, I was so afraid that I would be caught out or something would happen that I, um, I was, in a way I was petrified. And, um, but I learned to deal with that. I learned to cope with it. And I had great colleagues around me. In fact, the guy who, now that I think of it, he spent a lot of his time as a local reporter in Waterford. His name was Barry Lenane and he worked for the, the Press Association in London, and this guy was fantastic. You know when you meet somebody, be it a lecturer, or somebody who's just good with people, and he just picked me up in his hand, metaphorically, and he said, listen, I'm gonna help you, so if you have a problem, come to me, don't go to anybody else, and I'll look after you. And uh, he did. And so in a sense, I sort of began to develop and not feel inhibited any longer, and eventually, you know, I didn't read need the dictionary anymore because I suppose I got confidence and I wasn't as worried. So that's where, that's how I started and that's how I got into it. Were you aware back in the early 80s just how closed a society Ireland was? I mean Ireland was still very much in sort of the grip of the church and conservatism and in some ways it was a very, still quite an inward looking country. As someone like you who was <laughs> I suppose quite young and who was interested in social change. Was that something you were aware of? Uh, yes, because earlier, I can't think of how far back you had the, um, the trains going to Belfast, uh, the condom train, um, Nell McCafferty and others going to June Levine who was the name of one of the other people who organized to go to Belfast to get bring back condoms. And I can actually remember doing a story um, about uh, condoms in Dublin or the lack of them. And I also, I think around 19, I can't remember when, in the late 70s, I was involved, I, it was around 76 or 77, and I can't think of the name of the doctor, but he was a doctor who was in Ballyfermot in Dublin, and he, uh, women who needed abortions, who were in difficulties, he would organize for them to go to Manchester. And uh, believe it or not, I went to Manchester, I, I was a researcher on the program, and the reporter on the program, we followed a girl who was going on the, not the mail, but it was the B&I ferry from Dublin uh, to, I think it was to Liverpool. I, I think we ended up in Manchester. But the reporter on the story was Mary McAleese. And yes, she was Mary McAleese. Oh and uh, we followed this um, young girl who had difficulty and she was, had to have an abortion. So it was, an, it was a difficult issue to even do for television at the time. But yeah, I was aware of what was going on in the country. Like, wasn't. But it was also, at the time, the north of Ireland was such a big issue uh, in this country. I mean, in a way, it, in, and the economic circumstances, because there were petrol strikes, people were queuing for days getting petrol, <coughs> and there was lots of things happening. And uh, yeah, it was, um, compared to today, I mean, there's, you know, there's no comparison to um, 
So if you like the attitudes at the time, they were being they were just about <coughs> unlocked. I mean, thankfully we we were all um, well, hopefully in a, in a at least in a better place in our heads, if not financially, uh, what, what's happened to us. I think we'll be talking about that later because I believe that um, you know what's happened in the last few years is just absolutely reckless beyond belief. And most of us, most journalists knew what, uh, what was going on, and we we didn't raise our hands when we should have. You wouldn't be the first person who said that to me in the last couple of years. And um, one of the things that sort of we've looked at, particularly on on, on the, the, the social studies course is kind of the, the pathway that has kind of led us to where we are now. Um, and one of the, the names that has come up as possibly having contributed, whether materially or ideologically, to where we are now is um, Charles J. Hahi. Now, I know he would have been um, a major political figure during many of the years that you were reporting the news. I mean, what was your impression of him? Um, I was scared shitless of Charlie Hardy. <laughs> um, simply, Why? Well, like, for a simple reason, I was a young reporter, and um, when you went to press conferences, when you first of all, when you went into a room where he was, um, you know, he radiated a certain magnetism. Uh, albeit at the time, we didn't know <laughs> what was behind that magnetism, and um, you know. Yeah, people just looked at him in a different way, and yet, not long after he became Taoiseach, the rumours were going, were doing the rounds, you know, that he was having an affair, that, you know, in fact the one was Terry Keane, there was this famous uh, story being told that, you know, that PJ Mara, that himself and Terry had a row one night and he threw her some, the car, her handbag, into the Grand Canal, and all sorts of things, but nobody actually believed these things are those of us who, at this, at, at my distance, didn't know that this was actually going on. And one of the greatest pieces of television, and if you can ever get it, get it out or look at it, is the night that Terry um, Keane went on the Late Late Show uh, to talk about her affair uh, with Charlie Hoy, that long affair. It's just remarkable. It was gobsmacking. You couldn't believe. I mean, it's, you couldn't make it up. It had, been, it had been a rumor, and certain journalists and certain people knew about it because some people actually, if you like, cooperated in the subterfuge, booking rooms for them and booking restaurants, always the best restaurants, and yet it was sort of kept away. Um, it was in the back of some of the papers, but by and large, it, it was just people just steered away from it, as they also steered away from. Um, his financial um, dealings or the lack of them, because some people knew what was going on. I mean, allied Irish banks knew what was going on. Um, other institutions, large people, um, well, forget about Ben, well, let's not forget about Ben Dunn. Ben Dunn is a remarkable person. Um, what everyone might think of him, Ben Dunn is one of the most remarkable people that I know. And I'll tell you why, and it's really important. Every one of us in our lives can sometimes get into difficulty. We get into trouble. It doesn't matter who or what we are, but you know, we make a feck up of something, and it's how we deal with it. How we deal with it in our lives is really important. When I was a young reporter, Ben Dunn was in charge of Dunn Stores, the whole operation. Uh, ben Dunn Stores would never, ever give interviews, ever talk openly about anything. If you, if it was a bread war or a price war and milk. Uh, you'd ring up Dunn stores and this anonymous voice would answer the phone. We'd Ben Dunn himself and you'd get a quote, but he would never say, this is Ben Dunn, but it would be him. All phone calls were put through to him. But when the moment of the greatest crisis in his life came along, when he was found on top of that building in uh, Florida with a prostitute and uh, with cocaine up his nose, rather than running from the media, he came home here to Ireland and put his hands up. He invited a reporter, actually it was Mark Little, I'm always envious of Mark that it was to Mark Little he gave the interview, I don't know how it came about, but rather than continue to run and to hide, uh, he um, invited Mark Little into his home in uh, Castle Lock and he sat down and he told the truth. The simplest thing that anybody can do in this life is to tell the truth. 
And I, when I meet people or if I'm giving talks, people ask, how do you deal with a situation? Or how should a company or anybody deal with something? Well, I always say, you do what your mammy and daddy told you to do. Tell the truth. Because once you tell the truth, you cut the floor out of everything. In other words, the ghosts and whatever else is there can't come charging after you. And the other example, I know I'm digressing a little bit, but at the same time, as the Ben Dunn things happening, around the same time, another person in this country was in trouble. And that was Archbishop or Bishop Eamon Casey uh, when uh, news came out about his affair and that he had a child. He was the Bishop of Galway at the time. And what did Eamon Casey do when he got into trouble? He actually ran from the country and wouldn't talk to the media, wouldn't talk to the religious affairs correspondents, he went to South America. And as a result of that, the newspapers kept following him and following him and following him and hounding him and hounding him until eventually, you know, in a sense, they, it, he was brought down. It was like one of these sequences, you know, where you see him in, in, in the wilderness, whatever it is, some animal being chased, and eventually they're dragged down. But for that, it took maybe a year, 18 months, and he was, now you could say, it was right that people made him, uh, brought him to a, a account to tell what was going on. But he could have eased the pain for himself, for Annie Murphy, for his son, for everybody, for the church in Ireland, if he had actually stopped and told the truth. And he didn't, because he just ran from this country. And uh, for me, that is two of the great examples of how people mismanage uh, what they're dealing with in their personal lives or whenever it is. So for me, and it's one of the basic tenets that I have, you can have all the spin in the world, and I'm as a journalist, I've, most of my life has been dealing with PR people or whatever it is, and it's an industry, it's there, and there's nothing wrong with it. But for anybody who's in PR, anybody who's in any situation, anybody who's working in a company, in anything, the main thing to do is that when you or your company or your, whatever it is when you're in difficulty, gather your thoughts and then start telling the truth and then it just lances that boil, whatever it is. It's interesting that um, you, you talk about Bishop Casey, that uh, what he did in some ways seems so small now compared to some of the other awful things that have happened in the church. Well, they may have been small, but they weren't small at the Not time. Not at the time, because he was, he, because, I mean, that's, that's where the difference is, you know, uh, when you talk with hypocrisy, uh, you know, he was telling everybody to live, the, like Charlie Hockey, tell people to, you know, tighten to their tighten their belt. Because, the, I mean, I had, I had a lot of dealings with Charlie Hockey. He used to call me his favourite reporter. And at one stage, he actually, um, I'm going to tell you a story, and I'm going to leave one of the names out. Now, I'm going to tell you a story about him. Anyway, I'm going to be careful how I tell this story. <laughs> Anyone got any pen and paper? Take, take notes at this point. No, because he was, he was a really... Anyway, in the, in the last analysis, when he eventually went to the tribunal, when he was being brought before the tribunal, um, he, um, I remember the day when he was up there, in fact there was a light, it was in Dublin Castle and it was at the Moriarty Tribunal and they were putting the hard questions to him. This is a man who had been in self-denial for so long. And it, it, just to see when he was being taken apart, all the money, he, this guy got about 8 million. Over the years he'd got about 8 million. But the story I'm going to tell you is, and this is a vulgar story, and I mean this, but this, this is a true story. And it typifies what Charlie Hockey was. And, but I'm going to avoid uh, the name of the woman in, involved because that would be wrong. But an RT crew went to interview him in, his, in the Taoiseach's office one day. And um, there was an, is it Edward Delaney, uh, he's a um, sculptor. I think that, that's his name. Right, yeah. yeah, Edward Delaney. It was. Um, he had a, and it's, it, apparently it's still around, it's an, um, a bust, or a, a, it was a moulding of a bull in, in metal, absolutely fantastic looking um, engraving. And the RT crew were going, something to do with financial affairs, financial issues. And there were 
ladies in the room who had been working with him and he just looked at the bull and he says, you see that bull there? He says, every time so-and-so sees that bull, she creams her knickers. That was Charlie Hawley and that is a true story. And that's the type of person that he was. It's not very classy, is it? No, but that's the type of person that he was. This, I mean, that, I mean you, know, you know, in one sense, why would anybody do that to the mean people? But that's the type of individual he was. Uh, and that is a true story. And it's, um, in a way, it sums up. Uh, but, uh, you know, at the time, we didn't know that he'd been living off, you know, other people, Ben Don, all the other people, all the money that he'd been getting, that he'd been squandering. And, um, you know, it was just, and in a way, it summed up, if you like, something that was happening in, in, in Ireland at the time. And I know it's not popular to say this, but I will say it anyway, because even though there's no, no point in um, coming to tell people everything that they want to hear, the tribunals, um, the McCracken Tribunal, the Moriarty Tribunal, and the Flood Tribunal, despite all their costs, despite all their costs, they told us something about what was happening in this country, and that without them, we wouldn't have known we wouldn't have known the, the cronyism, uh, the corruption, the money that was given to politicians. You hear the description of how Ray Burke was um, given 30,000, a guy, it was, what's his name, the impresario, a nice man, but still, um, who got his secretary to get a bag and to put 30,000 uh, punts into it and bring it in to um, Ray Burke. The 50,000 which um, Pauli Flynn got. Uh, these things were going on. When Pauli Flynn got the 50,000 um, from Tom Gilmartin in a check, it would have bought a house. It would have bought a house, a semi-detached house in this country at the time. And yet he felt he was able to take that. And the excuse he used that Tom Gilmartin gave it to me because he wanted my campaign to be... Um, so I could continue my, my political career. Now, I don't know who wanted Pori Flynn's political career to continue. But that's what was going on. And then you come on to more recent times and to all the descriptions of the money that was given to Bertie Ahern. And they may be funny descriptions, but that's what was happening in this country. And uh, it shouldn't have taken you know, 20 or 30 million to get it out, I accept that. But if you put the totality and as students, as um, observers of what happened in this country, go back. If you, ha if, you, if you have an hour, go to a library and get out the McCracken report into the first tribunal about um, Charlie Hawley and uh, Ben Dunn. It's not all that long. It wasn't a hugely complicated report. But it reads like um, a detective novel. And again, even for me today, if you read just to I know we'll talk about it later on. Um, Simon Carswell's book uh, on Anglo-Irish Bank, uh, his latest book. Again, it reads like something. I don't. It's just. I don't know. It's. It's like. It's like it's just the whole thing fiction, but actually it's real. Because it's unbelievable that people were doing these things in such plain sight. Yeah, and not, what's even more unbelievable is that um, people were so gullible. And what's awful about, particularly the more recent events, um, particularly in relation, relation to Sean Fitzpatrick and David Drum and all of that, you know, everybody, there seemed to be a collective amnesia. And I, by the way, I'm putting myself, I mean, but all journalists in that as well. We were all sort of glazed over by what was happening in this country. I mean, a number of people did stand up and shout, stop. But as for a collective stop, that there was a collective madness. And I've said it before and I'll say it again, if anybody wants to do um, a thesis that will get you the equivalent of um, the Nobel Prize or whatever else it is, go to some library and read the newspapers for pick one or two years and all the glowing reports of how Anglo-Irish was, how the business correspondence, the financial correspondence, all paid tribute to this remarkable man, Sean Fitzpatrick. 
and um, they could have been to everybody, practically everybody in this country. And I'm talking about journalists as well. Now, let's take a, 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 a change of direction because one of the things that you've been quite well known for over the years has been the main link between the provisional IRA and RTE. H how did that originally come about? Um, well, in the early early 90s, the peace process was beginning to develop and uh, RT is no different than anybody else. It wants to get stories, it wants to be ahead of their competitors and the BBC and some of the British media and some of the British newspapers had basically people who um, had contacts with the IRA and so they wanted to know what was going on, and so therefore they would get exclusive stories about, you know, the IRA would say this, the IRA would say that. And um, so around, I think it was maybe 1992, I can't remember the precise day, but RTE decided that they um, wanted to have somebody who would liaise with the, uh, the IRA because the peace process with John Hume uh, stories were emerging about that there was talks going on and therefore they wanted to be, have an inside track. So, uh, in fact, one of my colleagues who's still there, Tommy Gorman, was one of the people I think who suggested that it couldn't be somebody from the north of Ireland, it was easier to have somebody from down here to do it. And um, I was, I just, somebody said, you know, you can go and meet the IRA and um, initially it was quite it was quite bizarre, it was quite scary, um, because um, it was, well, these people were killing people, it was an illegal organization, and yet you were put into a system, where it's like out of the movies, where you'd have to go and meet them, and you'd walk down side streets, and you'd go this way, and you'd meet in the cafe, and then you'd go off and go someplace else before they'd sit down. And the truth was, you know, you didn't get very much from them. It wasn't as if they were giving you, um, uh, you know, state secrets. But over time, over I was I did it for about ten years, uh, and over the years I was moved from one person to another as the peace process was developing. So from one contact to another. But the the one thing I would say uh, was that sometimes they would tell you nothing when you met them. Anyway, whoever the contact was, they were all they could do was tell you what the army council told them to tell you. So they would give you a statement, and they wouldn't even tell you if you would ask them another question. They wouldn't give you the time of day. They wouldn't say. So they would have a prearranged sort of agenda. Yeah, and just and tell you what it was. But the interesting thing was that they never told you anything that wasn't true. So in other words, if they told me, they would say, listen, this is what's going to happen today, or it's going to happen tomorrow, or this is our policy, this is what it is, or, you know, on Monday we're going to do something, or whatever it was, um, they always did it. So it was never, ever, ever, in all the years that, um, that I was dealing with them, did I ever have, um, did they ever tell me something that didn't turn out to be correct. And when they told you something was going to happen, I mean, might that be that a bomb was going to go off? No, or, no, no. What no. kind of things would it be? It was to say that they were, they were in negotiations, that the peace process was going there, or they were prepared to do something in the peace process, they were or weren't prepared to decommission, or whatever it was. It was always a policy. There was, uh, on one occasion, it got to, um, uh, sort of for me, it was a personal crisis point, and it still is for me today, it was the, um, the London bombings, the last London bombings of um, where, where the, all the newspapers are whopping. It, and they, there was a bomb went off there and um, it was on a Friday. I'll never forget it for the rest of my life um, because normally the contact would ring me and just, they always gave me a code. And it wasn't like in the movies, it wasn't, you know, fish or something. It was always the person's name saying, and I know, I don't can tell you, it was either Brandon or it was something. And they were the names of which I always knew them as, even though that wasn't their real name. But I, Brenda would say, this is Brendan ringing, uh, kind of talk to Charlie. And so one Friday they rang. So the, the IRA ceasefire had been in place for about 18 months. And um, I got a, there was a phone call on the Friday and I, I wasn't there. I'd gone home from work 
don't know why I didn't really need my mobile phone, but I'd gone home from work, and um, so I got a, a phone call from a chap called Peter Klosky, who was on the news desk on the day, and he said, Charlie, listen, this guy called Brendan has been ringing looking for you um, for the past hour, non-stop. And uh, he, he's after leaving this statement for you, uh, saying that the, um, the IRA ceasefire is over. And at the same time, the IRA had phoned um, to the Metropolitan Police in London to say that bombs were going to go off at 7 o'clock. Now, everybody was in total confusion because um, the IRA ceasefire uh, hadn't been broken, it was still on. And yet, they were two pieces of information and they weren't certain if the message for me was um, real or not. So anyway, I, they, the lads rang me at home so I, I disappeared off because I knew somebody in Dublin who could help me with it. And as I was getting to this person's house, my um, mobile phone actually came, started to ring and it was my contact Brendan, he said, Charlie, he says, um, uh, that story which you've been given, that is true. He said, listen, I know this is very late in the day, but he said, you've got to get it on air now. And um, so I remember getting back to the RT newsroom and going into the late into the six o'clock news. Eamon Lawler, I think, was the news leader at the time. I was walking out of the, the studio when news came through that two bombs had gone off in uh, London. And I think it was two people who were killed. And I've always, for myself personally, I've always believed that, you know, in one sense that I was responsible, or not responsible directly, but if I'd been where, uh, if I'd been closer to RT or something on the day, that those two people wouldn't have them. Um, one of them was a, a flower seller, a newspaper seller, and there were two people anyway. Uh, so that was it. But anyway, afterwards it developed on to meeting them, and eventually the the bizarre thing is that when the peace process came into being and when Sinn Féin government ministers and various things were happening, I would often see uh, at least one of my contacts. No, they weren't government ministers, by the way, but often see one of my contacts close to, um, well, this way, a government minister in the north of Ireland. But that's, that was life and that's how it worked. Do you think that your, your contact, Brendan was the name you used from there. Do you think his intent in contacting you about that was to try and save lives? Oh yeah, absolutely, yeah. I think so, yeah, no, when they did things, they did them. Listen, when they killed people, they killed them. That was not, there's no point in, um, this is not something that's easy to deal with. Um, I mean, uh, sorry, I'm gonna go back to one of the most, one of the most interesting things in my life was that when I was working in the Irish Times Library, the, the Dublin and Monaghan bombings happened, and I was in, the Irish Times office in Westmoreland Street on the Friday the bombs went off. And my, I didn't leave because I was there, but the photographers from the Irish Times, they walk out just a row into Talbot Street and then down to, around to Trinity College. And they were coming back with the photographs of the people who were, who were mutilated and mangled. And, um, you know, these were photographs that you would never ever put out on, um, you know, in newspapers. So, you know, as a young, basically as a young reporter, um, or a young librarian at the time, it was, it was stuff to see these things. Now, subsequently, over the years, I've gone on to see things just as bad anyway, traveling abroad mm. uh, for RTE. But, you know, the, what happened in this country, it was awful. But we have moved so far on that um, uh, it, just, it is just absolutely remarkable uh, to think of what's happened, of the transformation of what's happened in this country. You mentioned that you've seen other you know, <coughs> equally distressing things in your career. I mean, you've covered uh, environmental disasters, earthquakes and tsunamis all over the world. But what's been the most traumatic event you've had to cover? Well, I'm not certain. It doesn't matter whether it's five people or 50 people or sure. 100 people. You know, if you come across a site where um, people are starving or where people are dying and um, you know it's it, 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 it's 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 hard to describe the smell of death but once you smell it once you know it so whenever it was the first time as a young reporter abroad in Africa and I smelled people you know dead bodies decaying it's the same smell I mean the last one I was at was at the tsunami or the uh, Haiti earthquake and um, 
where they had a keep. There's different figures as to whether it's two, a quarter of a million people died or 150,000 or 100,000 people. It's a bizarre thing that, you know, that even in today, with all the sophistication, that you know, nobody can give an accurate account as to whether it was 100,000 people who died or a quarter of a million people. As I said to you earlier, Shane, the difference between 100,000 and 250,000 is 150,000 people. Just think of it. It's twice the size of all, if you put Crow Park, double that. And it's not just the um, 150,000 people, it's all their friends, their relatives, everything about it. And uh, so it's a strange um, phenomenon to go to some place. Again, I was at the tsunami in, uh, I went to Sri Lanka, just within days of it happening. And um, you don't see you know, fields of dead bodies and the whole thing, it's, it's, it's so horrendous. Is it easy, I mean, Ireland is a small and relatively safe place. The weather never really gets all that extreme and um, you know, things kind of tick along quite nicely usually. I mean, how do you, how do you integrate something like that into your perspective of how the world works when you see it? It's like something out of Dante's Inferno. Well, first of all, any reporter, and even more so for the cameraman or camera person, whoever it is, who goes there, um, you're an automation, you just go and do things. There is an unfortunate thing about the world we live in at the moment, and, um, you know, the war in Libya, uh, probably, you know, each time there's a, there's a war now, or, you know, what's happening in Egypt, you know, everything is televised to such an extent now. It's on, um, you know, mobile. everybody's a reporter. Every single person in this room now is a reporter, or a potential reporter, because you have a mobile phone, and if you use an iPhone now, apparently they're so sophisticated, they actually, the quality of the pictures can be used on television. I mean, the first time that, if you like, uh, telephone, or what they call them, mobile phone pictures, were used to any degree was after the London um, bombings and the tube bombings and you know the media immediately saw the effect that it could have and the dramatic effect now everybody is a, a journalist and you know and also the other thing is that more and more journalists are taking risks because if it's Sky or CNN they want to beat their competitors they want to be ahead of Al Jazeera they want to be ahead of somebody else whatever else it is and they just want to get out there and get the photographs. And um, people are taking more and more risks to do things. I mean, God only knows what it's going to be like in 20 years' time, and war is going to continue to happen, crises will continue to happen, and um, you know, the, the images, the graphic images are becoming more and more um, uh, frightening. But the, the other side of that is, and if anybody has been watching television recently, and to me, is the Levison inquiry in, uh, in relation to the media. You know, when I talk about the media, I talk about it collectively, and I don't exclude myself or the business that I'm in. You know, we, sometimes we reach for the lowest common denominator, not the highest common denominator. And I think that is a really, really sad situation that, um, you know, we're, we're, we're pushing ourselves. Maybe all of us are becoming a little bit more voyeuristic. We want to see... Um, did anybody see a picture? Was it in the Irish? One of the papers the other day of four women in China who were um, due to be executed. And some agency was allowed to spend 24 hours with them, taking the photographs of everything they were doing. And they were smiling, they were having their, their face made up. I mean, it, it was just so awful. It was in one of the papers this weekend. If you could go online to see it, China, whatever it is, but it just, it's absolutely awful. I mean, any, practically nothing has been left anymore. Now, they didn't show the execution. It certainly wasn't in the papers, but I mean, it just, the whole thing was, was, was grotesque. Have we created that in some way? Yes, we have. I mean, there's that famous yeah. photograph. Um, we the, have the Vietnam War of the, the man yeah. being executed. Yeah, we have. We've all, we, we have created that. I mean, collectively, all of us. And um, so sometimes, I mean, I'm not... Um, I mean, I, I've done things wrong 
myself. So I'm not sitting up here saying the paragon of virtue. There's two things I can remember. First of all, um, it was it wasn't long after I became a reporter uh, on news, and then you know when I joined in 1980, first there were still film cameras, and then it was probably 1983 or 1984 we started to use video or ENG cameras. And I can remember this, this, this when it happened. There was a bank manager, I don't know from which bank, he was held hostage uh, someplace in Dublin. Uh, I think he was the manager of a bank in Dalkey. He was held hostage with his wife. Um, I'm not certain it was even the IRA, it was just gangsters. And I was outside their house with a lot of other media people when they arrived back after they'd been released. And it was coming up to the lunchtime news, and with ENG, with, with a video, video camera, it's not as if you go back and have the whole thing processed and it takes two hours. That's what happened initially when I joined RT. You know, to do a story, you could you go out and film it. It took four hours to have it ready for television. It had to be filmed, had to be dubbed, everything had to be done. But with video, it's back, and within seconds you can just run it, put it out raw, or you can edit it within 20 minutes, and you can certainly chunk it out and make it do it all so quickly. And I like the lines there, white line, what's, what's proper and right, sometimes you can overstep it. And I was so enthusiastic, I was in such a rush that, you know, as soon as they got out of the car, I put the microphone under the nose of this unfortunate woman and started asking her what it was like, or some stupid, inane uh, question. And, um, you know, she, she just put her hands up, her and her somewhere, people just pushed us away. So went back to RT, put it out in the one o'clock news, and I saw it by out myself. And the strange thing was that nobody else said anything. They didn't say, Jesus, that was a bit OTT. And, um, but I looked at it myself, and I realized how awful it was. What a, it just, I just realized what a mistake I'd made. You know, that this was not right. Uh, that was something I had just transgressed. I'd moved from what I call as that fine line of doing something that is right as a journalist to doing something that is wrong. And on that occasion, I got it completely wrong. And I'm, by the way, there have been probably other times that I know that I've done things that haven't been, um, you know, I wouldn't exactly say I'm very proud of, but I've tried to learn. Uh, I've tried to hold myself back and say, listen, one must be careful. And last year, I learned, I learned a lesson because I don't know, because David Drum was talking about the fact that I went to his house in Cape Cod recently when he did an interview for the Business Post and said the great Charlie Bird was outside shouting at him, you know, on the day that it was his daughter's 15th birthday. Well, I don't believe there was a birthday going on at the house. But I got, I was on radio the other day talking about that interview because he was, David Drum was given out about the fact that I was at his house. But he, on the day that I went to his house, I don't know how many, how many people here have seen the doorstep that I did with David Drum. Okay, but when I went to his house, it's really important First of all, I didn't realise he was in the house, and the cameraman wasn't on his property. He was filming. Now I was mic'd up and I walked up, but I didn't think he was there. That it was dark, and as soon as I saw him, I saw David Drum was inside, and he said, "Charlie, go away." And I said, "I want to ask you a question." As soon as he said to me, and that it's on the tape, it'll always be there. As soon as he said to me, "By the way, listen, my wife and children are in here. Would you go away?" I, I put one other sentence to him, and then I turned around and walked away, because I accepted. That whatever crime or whatever issue that all of us have with David Drum, we can't have it with his wife and his children. And that is, a, to me, the, and, I, and I still have, I mean, I, I didn't do anything that I, that I wouldn't do again for him. I might have spent another 20 seconds putting another question to him. But, um, you know, it's a bit galling of him from a man who won't come back to talk to the, to the guards here to be complaining about us. But I do still think it is important, no matter who a person is, and whatever issue we may have with them, you, know, you can't bring the rest of the family into it. And that you do have to, and you do have to be responsible. And I would just say, on that occasion, certainly I believe that I was responsible. I'm not saying it, it happens all the time, that people are <coughs> responsible, that the media is responsible, and I've admitted to put my own hands up and say that in the past, you know, um, I haven't always done things uh, right and proper. You mentioned the media and how it has changed and how it kind of impacts on our lives. Um, if you were to ask my daughter what she... Just
13 years old. What she thinks of Barack Obama, her reaction would be kind of much like a rock star, and a lot of her friends are the same, you know? Um, he did that very famous um, kind of village square thing sure. where he answered questions in schools and things like that, and, um, you know, my daughter's school participated in that. Uh, yeah. I mean, you've been to the States, you read Obama's inauguration. I mean, he's a president who reminds me an awful lot of the way Kennedy used the media back in the early 60s, you know, how he really harnessed it. You know, he was sending emails to, uh, you know, individually to his supporters during the campaign trail. I mean, how do you think he has changed the way politicians use the media? Uh, well, I, I think because of his campaign was so um, fantastic. Well, first of all, I'm probably, I'm a reporter, but every reporter, every individual has their own view of life. Um, I vote. If I were in the United States in the last election, I'd have been voting for Barack Obama. There's absolutely no doubt. And um, I probably won't be back covering it next year, so I can say the same. Um, whatever he's done wrong, you know, I still think that, first of all, the fact that straight up that a black person was in the White House. It's absolutely remarkable. And you know, the first thing that Barack Obama did when he got into the White House, the first piece of legislation that he passed, they didn't really know what it was. I know the answer, you probably don't, but I'm going to tell you. What? No, no, the first thing that he had passed the first piece of legislation that he had passed, believe it or not, this is, it wasn't quite equal pay for women. It was woman, he met a woman called Lily Ledbetter. This is a remarkable story during the campaign. And Lily Ledbetter had worked in a tire factory. And when they were being let go, all the men were entitled to a certain, whatever it was, because they were men, because she was a woman she wasn't entitled to the same amount of money. And Barack Obama, if he did nothing else, and this is, and this is only, what, three years ago, he introduced a bill where women would be treated equally as men. That's what he did. The very first thing that he signed into law was the Lily Ledbetter, and she was in the Oval Office with him on the day. Um, and you know, we're into, what, 2000 or something? Who would ever thought that that was still something in America that had to be changed? So in other words, that women were entitled to, to whatever it was, that while it was to do with equal pay, but it was equal pay in relation to redundancy or something odd. But that's America that had all these fantastic things. Anyway, I think that the guy is remarkable. I think it was them. Um, as I'm, again, I'm saying to Shane, America is going to, um, I watched the Tea Party people uh, last year. Just explain year. maybe who they are. Cause of, well, they're, they're, you see, America, it's a, it's a melting pot. You know, the new, the new Irish in America today are the Latinos. Um, it's no longer, you know, we're no longer, the Irish people are no longer the real force in America. It's the Latinos, the Mexicans, go all the way down through South America people who come across uh, the border down in the south. I went there when I was doing the documentary on America, watching the, you know, the people, you know, thousands of, well, not th that's, I shouldn't say thousands, but I think it's maybe eight or 900 people die every year of, um, from dehydration and um, heat exhaustion, trying to get into America right down from the south all the way along. You know, the people are being turned around and sent back all the time. And one of the governors down there, there was a group of American, white American people who were helping the, the Latinos as they come across. And these people are going to every part of America to work in McDonald's, anything. They're in such desperation. They're coming across in huge numbers every day. But this group of um, elderly Americans who are the opposite side of the Tea Party, go out into the desert and they leave um, par parcels of water and food all around the desert. So if the people are coming across and they're starving and they're dehydrated, then they find these caches of, of water there. And the local governor in the area introduced a law that, 
that um, they will be charged with littering the desert for leaving water. For leaving water in the desert to help people survive. And um, yeah, this is how, you know, in sense, how bizarre aspects of, a, of, a, of, a, of America can be. But the, the Tea Party movement is it's a conservative movement. Um, and it's, in a way, it's a fundamentalist movement. And um, is it a backlash, do you think? I mean, America's going through the recession um, not quite the same as we are, but they're going through a tough time economically. Well, sorry, they're, they're going through an even bigger recession because the... Um, in one month, in the first month that I went to America working there, in one month alone, 750,000 people lost their jobs in the United States. I mean, in just one month. If you, I know it's a huge country, uh, but that's an enormous number of people uh, who lost their jobs. And again, it's not just, as you know, it's not one person, it's the, the families, the infrastructures, everything about it. And you know the healthcare system is not. We complain about it here. By God, um, even has anybody been to Washington recently? You walk around Washington. It's just amazing. The number of people living rough on the streets of Washington is incredible. Absolutely incredible. Because I think it was George Bush um, Jr. Now I might be wrong. It could be his father. But I think it was George. Bush Jr. the first time he got in, they basically he, or, he ordered the closure of a whole lot of um, psychiatric hospitals as a cost-cutting measure, and all these people were put out onto the streets. And um, I mean, you don't have to go only a block, two blocks from the White House, and in the middle of winter, and you know Washington is one of the coldest places in winter. I mean, it's like being up in the, the Arctic, and um, you're just lying in these, you know, where the grates are, where the the heat is coming up much more than in, in New York. Um, I mean, there's a, a poverty situation in America that most people just do not, um, uh, you just don't see. You, you mentioned the, the Arctic. Um, the last time we were chatting, you, you said that one of the things you'll be able to boast about when you reach um, fine old age, that you've uh, been to both poles. Yeah, I mean, it's fantastic. It's um, yeah, I was to the North Pole, and this, well, this time last year I was actually down in the, uh, I did two journeys down to the Antarctic um, to do this recreation of um, uh, the story about Tom Cree, and this, it, just in, it was just an amazing story about this guy from Anne's Skull. Uh, I don't know how many of you, anyway, I, I actually haven't seen the play, but I'm told it's fantastic, but he just, it, Tom Cree is one of these remarkable, stories about a remarkable individual of somebody who did something absolutely uh, remarkable and uh, so last year we went to the Antarctic and then eventually after Christmas I was fortunate enough after a sort of a circuitous journey to make it to the South Pole to do the you know try and tell his story but it's interesting the one thing about the Antarctic and I'm not going to go on too long about it is that despite all the negative things in this world and all the, I feel like all the bitching and all the fighting, at least the countries in the world have decided that Antarctica should remain in its um, pristine condition. And it's now, so it is fantastic that it is one place in the world which is, is there solely for peace and scientific purposes. And that um, I don't think there won't be any madness of anybody ever uh, mining down there for it. But on the other hand, when I did the program on the going to the North Pole, I also went to the Canadian Arctic. And there, and Shane and I, I think we share a certain interest in this, but I came across for the first time the Inuit people. And they're absolutely, and I mean, an absolutely remarkable uh, group of people. These are, I mean, they're, you can have them in Greenland, but the Canadian, uh, or the Inuit people who, our ancestors, they go back for thousands upon thousands of years. Um, but this Inuit hunter brought us out with him, out with his dog sled um, team, out onto what, what they call the land. The land for them is the ice. But they have no, there's nothing, nothing grows up there um, on the, even when the snow disappears at certain times of the year. And they live this just 
incredible life. And, um, but the, the mistreatment of the Inuit people by the Canadian government is exactly what happened to the Aborigines uh, in um, Australia. And the Inuit people were disgracefully treated. And um, basically, this guy, his hunter I met, was a, his Jabedi Atayago was his name. But when he was only five years of age, he was much further down in the sort of what I would call towards, the, you know, in Canada. But the, the Canadian government were so concerned that the Americans and the Russians were going to take part of the Canadian Arctic away from them for oil exploration that they dumped the Inuit people. They got families and they brought them back up and dumped them there with absolutely no medical, with little or no food. They, just, they, they, it was, they mistreated them. And uh, if you actually research it or go and look at the websites, eventually the Canadian government, there was a commission of inquiry and the Canadian government um, held their hands up and said that they were talking about mistreatment of, a, of, a, of an ethnic group. It was, they put everybody to shame and people forget that. Uh, so just like the Aborigines, the Canadian government eventually had to uh, apologize for the treatment of these, uh, of the Inuit people. And the Inuit people, like the, um, the Aborigines, alcoholism, drugs, were practically wiped out um, because of the way, um, you know, the ravages of life and the way they were mistreated. But they're just an absolutely remarkable people. And um, I mean, that's when I was there, you could see for the first time, they were, this hunter brought me out onto, as I said, out onto the land to show me where the glaciers that when he was young, they were so long, and now you could see them, he could show me where they had been reduced. And he could explain that over the years, in this would look like pristine white ice, that there was um, a black smut, smut had been, because it was coming from industrial part of the world, and that's where it ends up uh, on, the, um, on the ice, and then as a result of it, the polar bears, who are, they're losing their habitat, and um, it was at five o'clock in the morning, I had probably my, we spent a week looking to see a polar bear out with the Inuit hunter, it was part of the whole project, and um, at five o'clock one morning, my family came. The hunter brought us, he didn't know where, he couldn't find but from nowhere. I, this polar bear was rolling around in this lump of ice, and it was just the most amazing experience for me to actually see. They're bloody huge, though, aren't yeah, they? Yeah, polar bear in its natural habitat. It was, um, and the man who filmed it is a chap called Doug Allen. And Doug Allen is, has got two Emmys and two BAFTAs to his name because he does all the filming for um, the Frozen Planet and for Planet Earth for the BBC. And so he spent three weeks, when he wasn't on assignment for the BBC, with us working on it. And um, so the name Doug Allen, if you want to look it up, he's just this most remarkable cameraman, but he actually filmed the sequence. So I spent three weeks up there with this incredible cameraman and this incredible Inuit hunter. So in a way for me, you know, to have been able to break the cycle of, you know, not having done well at school, to have ended up doing things like that, you know, going to the Canadian Arctic, going to the South Pole. As I said, you can win the lotto, uh, but nothing, absolutely nothing in this life can buy you um, those memories and those things. And I still believe it is possible for, e for every one of us, maybe not to do all of those things, but, you know, I do think it's really, you know, Everybody can challenge themselves to do something that, they, that, that can have the same meaning uh, for themselves in the end. And, uh, I think it's really important. Just one, one final question before I hand you over to the, um, to the students. Uh, yesterday and today are budget day, okay, which is you know, another, another way of saying bad news, you know, more bad news on a fairly huge level. Um, for, for most of the students gathered before us, um, the big question that they've got and the big thing that they're wondering about is obviously, you know, increases in college fees, 
the grants being taken away, reduction in college places, all of these things. I mean, at the moment you've got a, a radio program on um, Saturday afternoons, you're traveling around the country. Um, I mean, w what are your expectations? Are people hopeful? For the future, do you think? I, I don't know, I would be more interested in what, to be honest, what the people here, because I'm only, listen, we all know what the situation is. Every one of us know, knows what the situation is. But the one thing I would say about it is that it wasn't um, Lehman Brothers which brought us down. Don't, uh, don't believe that, I'm gonna be crude, don't believe that shit, it wasn't Lehman Brothers that brought us down. It was the greed that was happening in this country. There's absolutely no doubt about it. No doubt. Yeah. Well, let me tell you a story. This is really important to me. That myself and George Lee were involved in the story, not about the, the National Irish Bank story and Beverly Cooper Flynn are two different stories, by the way. Just, I was involved with George Lee in doing this story about National Irish Bank. And what we discovered about National Irish Bank back in 1998-97, when this contact came to me, to say that basically this bank was encouraging people to evade tax, not avoid tax, because there's a, there's a difference. You know, every one of us are entitled to avoid our tax if we can do whatever, but you can't evade tax. You know, you can do things the system says, right, you can, evade, you, you can avoid if you do this, you can do something else, that is all legal. But there was a culture in this country, and I am absolutely convinced, I'm absolutely convinced of this, that in this room, at this very moment, if you were to go back to your parents, to your uncles, to your aunts, or some way in your own connection, I am absolutely convinced that at least a number of people here, they, know, they will know a relative or a friend back in the 80s, or the, or the 80s and the early 90s, who had a bogus non-resident account. Well, I'll tell you why. Because there were over 250 to 300,000 of them at the time set up. But that wasn't to evade, that wasn't to avoid tax, that was to evade it. A blind eye was turned. And myself and George Lee, we travelled down um, the country on one occasion to meet, a, a, um, he was a haulier. And somebody had set up for him 300, yeah, he had them all, by the way, in boxes. He had 300 fake accounts that had been set up by bank managers all over the place. And I know who one of the bank managers was because he told me. And it was, his, put it this way, his name would be well known because one of his relatives was well known in the country. That's all I'm going to say to you. But everybody... So like a cliche, everybody was at it. We met another guy who worked in the Allied Irish Bank in Port Leisha, and he brought along a computer printout of everybody in Port Leisha, in the Allied Irish Bank on a particular day, back in 1990 something, who had a bogus non-resident account. And there were over 300 of them, over 300. But what happened after that, for me, was the real greed, was the property developers. And the whole madness started. And um, just so many of them. It was, what was going on was absolutely, and it was, if you, and you, we all know this, it was typified more than anything else. And this is where I sort of, I could get myself into a little bit of trouble here, but I'm gonna say it anyway. It was typified in a sense by the, the Fianna Fáil tent at the Galway races. And this is not dumping on Fianna Fáil, it's just the, whole, it's the system. What was, what was, everybody seemed to be out um, doing it. And I mean, I can remember um, seeing some of the, because I was involved in watching some of the property developers, the people who were around Bertier, and it, it would make your, your skin creep. Because people didn't know what was going on. We didn't probably know the full extent of it. And so it wasn't the, the Lehman Brothers. It's what was happening in this country here that it, to some extent um, uh, brought us to where we are today. And um, 
But whatever about the bogus non-resident accounts, you know, people with a couple of hundred euros or punts that they had in them, I mean, these other people, they perfected it to a, to, um, to a degree that's just remarkable. And that's why I say, if you don't read, if there's no other book that you read this year, that's probably not good grammar, read Simon Carswell's book about Anglo-Irish. Because there was, a, there was a book a few years ago called Bonfire of the Vanities, I don't know if you remember it. Yeah, just an amazing book about, you know, greed in this world. If you read um, Simon Carswell's book about what was going on in Anglo-Irish, Talk about the greed, and there was another story recently, I'm digressing, but there was another story recently about, it was Ireland and Joe Duffy, it was about some pensions company in Dublin, and it was a few weeks ago, and they were, and they were all putting their money, these were people, you know, some of them were really well-to-do people, or who were legitimately putting their, their money into this pensions company, and it's gone well up in the last 18 months, with about 60 million missing. And the phone calls to Joe Duffy that people who were doing which the government had told this wasn't a government, you know, failure now, it's just a systems failure. Uh, but the, the, um, the regulator um, was watching nothing. One other point, I did a story about, after, I, after NIV, I did a story about Allied Irish Bank. Um, this whistleblower contacted me about, about um, Allied Irish Bank, about a foreign exchange um, scam that went wrong. And um, it cost um, Allied Irish Bank maybe, eventually had to give back about 20 or 25 million. So it was a story ran for a couple of weeks. But basically the system was that in this case, this whistleblower had gone to the regulator. The regulator. This whistleblower went to the regulator. The guy, by the way, is the same man who was eventually forced to resign. I can't think of his name, but he's now gone. But he was the guy who was there throughout all of Anglo-Irish. But he actually, was a bank official, went to the regulator and said, listen, this is what's been happening in Allied Irish Bank. The regulator did nothing about the story. And this guy was so frustrated, so pissed off, that he came to me. But his first port of call wasn't to go to the media. His first port of call was to go to the regulator in this country so and follow the there. proper procedure. And the regulator just did that. And that's what was happening in this country. Well, I mean, it's, 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 uh, it's depressing when you kind of look at it in those, in those um, colours. But, uh, okay, let's go to some questions from the floor. Wayne. Um, Charlie, um, I haven't reported to Charles Hall, Yarra, and uh, Courtney Hans, Yarra. Um, where do you think the problems actually started? If you had to pinpoint a beginning, what do you think the beginning would be of our financial? Well, I think I think there was too much of a cosy relationship between, if you like, between big business and um, the political um, system. Big business is important. Don't anybody think that well, I don't think it is? It's crucially important. They have to provide jobs. We have to. This is the world we live in. But it just became too cosy, and it's what I've been talking about. Anglo Irish Bank, the, all the banks. You know, the the more you read about um, what Charlie Hawley was up to, you know, um, did Charlie Hawley do something? Did he actually do anything for the money that he was given? The answer is he may not. In Charlie Hawley's case, I'm not, I just don't know. The answer is I don't know um, whether he did or not. But when you can take a million pounds from somebody and put it in your pocket, you know that's wrong. Everybody knows that's wrong. If you're in, in, a, in a position of trust, even if you don't do anything for it, if nobody gives away money for nothing. So it's that's wrong, and that's what he got. Big fella, there is a million. I mean, just think about it. Somebody gives you a check for a million, whatever it was, you punts at the time or whatever they were at the time, and you know, guys who gave the whip around for Bertie or her, and they brought in thirty thousand into his into his office in St Luke's. I mean, I know Bertie or her. I mean, I was on the street. I was, I was as a reporter. I spent. I covered two of his elections, I mean, every day I was with him. I saw the reaction of the, 
public tomb, how fantastic he was. And, um, but yet when I heard all the stories about what was going on in St. Luke's, about people bringing money to him, the whip, the whip rounds, were you surprised? I, just, I know that, yes, of course I was surprised, but mm. I just know, and it's, this is what's simple about life. To me, it's really simple, and it goes back to telling the truth, you know. You don't need somebody, you don't need your conscience to get you. It's what your parents bring you up as, what is right and what is wrong. So if somebody gives you a lot of money for nothing, it's not really for nothing, it's to embrace them so they can be beside you or whatever else it is. And I can remember going around with them. Bertie Aaron's last trip to America, as before I was Washington correspondent, he went in this great uh, tour of, of America and he had Sean Dunn, the, the developer, with him. You know, he was part of the entourage with him and when he was addressing the, you know, the joint houses uh, in, on Capitol Hill. I remember thinking at the time, why is Sean Dunn, this property developer guy, now has run off to America and has left his everything in NAMA? No. He didn't have to bring him. He didn't have to do that. You know, but that's part of it. So, you know, sometimes it's not necessarily, you know, I'm going to change the planning laws for you. It's just, you know, you can be, you can, you know, it's, Something not right about it. Uh, I, yet, I don't want to be holier than thou. You know, as I said before, you know, I think collectively <coughs> the media, we could have done more. There's absolutely no doubt. I think, you know, uh, the, the media probably, you, you know, things were done at the time. You know, Michael Fingleton, um, so many people knew what Michael Fingleton was up to. And not that he was up to huge. You know, it's, I don't know where it's stated, but just that, you know, he looked after, I'd say half the journalists in Dublin got mortgages from Michael Fingleton. That's the truth of it. <laughs> it's an exaggeration. It's wrong. Half the journalists didn't, but certainly a good proportion. That's what I'm trying to be honest with. You know, where, this is because I knew Michael Fingleton, he look after you for a mortgage, nice. you know, and that's the lads, ah, oh, Michael Fingleton's one of the lads, do this, do that. And so it's that type of attitude that, you know, has got us to where we are today, where, where people are absolutely crucified. Okay, Sarah. Um, when you started reporting on what was going around in the country, did you think it would have ended up as bad as it had happened? When you started reporting on when things were starting to go downhill in the country, did you ever envision that they would go quite as bad as they are now? Um, no, is the answer. But I can remember... I can remember at the, not the last election, the previous one, the one where um, Bertie Hearn was elected um, for the third time. That to me was one of the most amazing elections that has happened in this country because, you know, Fianna Fáil have been in power and this has nothing to do with party politics. So what I'm saying is to be really honest about this. To me it's not, you know, the people vote governments in and the people are, that's, you know, you can't argue with the people. You know, you, um, you, we vote. That's the good thing about this country, compared to other countries which don't have a vote. And when, a, when an election happens in this country, it changes from one government to another without bloodshed or without anything. So this is a, that's what's great of living in a democracy. But I have to admit, and I was a journalist watching that, that third election when Fianna Fáil had been in for so long, I said, I'm pulling my hair. I said, you know, they're doing it again. Uh, so, and yet, so when I came back from America and last early in this year, I could see what was going on. I mean, a blind man on the street could see what ha was happening in this country. That, um, and I just think what is good and that people really have woken up now. They may not be out in the streets marching, but by God, are they exercised? And um, I think it's important that people question. They question the politicians, they question the journalists, they don't let us off with it, they don't, and they don't take blandly accept everything that's been said. Um, okay? Yeah, so Captain, the Eurozone law seems to be playing the next to the brush up in your German. Well, I certainly <laughs> brush up in your German, God, yeah. I, would, I mean, I brush up my German anyway, because I think it's, um, it's um, yeah. I mean, I don't know, I asked the question the other day, because I'm not a financial journalist, and I am genuinely, um, um, I know David Mac Williams. I'd be asking the same. I asked George Lee as a friend of mine. I sat George down the other day in the canteen and said, "George, tell me, you know, are we going to lose the euro?" 
And he says, no, he said, we're not. Now, I, that's George's view. Um, but I mean, we know we're skating all over the place at the moment. Um, you know, there's a bank guarantee there. And I know that, again, it's listening to, what really is important is how you listen to people. What they're saying, and again, I, you know, whatever you might think of Joe, the Joe Duffy problem, just listen to the voices of people ringing up. I mean, was it last Thursday people were talking about, you know, should I keep my, you know, money in the biscuit tin, take it out of the banks, put it into dollars, put it into this. I mean, people are scared. Scared shitless at the moment, and I can see why. Um, it's, uh, as I said, it's to do with them, um, we know, this is what's important. We did get it so wrong here. That's why I mean, the idea that it was Lehman Brothers or somebody else, it was greed in this country that, that brought us down. I and mean, you see the situation in Nana, and um, I don't know what's going to happen, because I'm not in. I mean, I'm just listening. I mean, you heard people take, put it in gold. You know, gold is at $1,900 or Troy ounce or whatever it's called. It's going to go up to 2500 by Christmas. Well, most people can't afford to be doing that anyway, because they're trying to just live. Uh, day to day, and um, I mean, I'm in a forced position. I've got a good job in RTE, um, but I know people all around me. I'm uh, really close friends who, like everybody else, have been burned, have done stupid things, bought a second house, thought it was a good idea, and they're fecked now, completely. Well, you know, it's you know, they are all everybody's. There must be nobody in this room who doesn't know somebody who isn't hurting. And um, you know whether um, do we have control of it? The answer is we don't. Uh, and how do you put a, a human face, you know, on? You know, there was a picture the other day of a thousand people queuing outside the Capuchin Friary in Dublin for food. A thousand people. It's amazing, isn't it? You know, it's the same in America, by the way. They have they get, they give out food parcels in America. Uh, in fact, what they do is you actually just, they don't actually physically give them, you, you go into a supermarket and when you're doing your shopping, you can buy a food parcel and then it's packed up and then it's given to somebody. But people all over America are living like that. Um, you know, the number, of, we went to some place filming our home for closures, thousands, I mean, I'm talking about thousands of houses, completely empty. We know there are ghost town estates around here. But it's, you know, in America, it's everything is just, everything in America is big. It's on a grand scale. So when you talk about foreclosures and houses, we're talking about thousands upon thousands of houses. I went to, where was it in, where is my town? Is it up in Detroit? Detroit. And if I could describe to you what Detroit City looks like, you wouldn't believe it. It's remarkable. You get on a plane from Washington and you can be in Detroit in an hour and a half. You get into a car and you can drive out of the city for maybe into what you call the suburbs. And then it is just one vast wilderness of burned out houses. This is in America. This is the home of capitalism, it's the home of everything. Sounds like something that a Mad Max. But if you go online. Look at Detroit, look at the places that it is. If you pick one of us, only one city in America to look at, it's there. There are all these wooden houses and they're burned and people just burn them as they leave them. And we're talking about thousands and thousands of houses. Because it's, that's what's, you know, it's, it's like Mad Max. It's like, if you could think, you know, 20 years, 30 years down, it's like, to me it was like the nuclear winter. Exactly, and this is America and it's only an hour's an hour and a half from, on a plane from Washington. And, you know, yet it has in the, even the first part of the city, these huge big gaming arcades. And I don't, Has anybody here been to Las Vegas? So anybody, you know how mad it is. Huge, it's, I was there for the first time. And you know, it's just, it's bizarre. You get out of this plane and you go into these huge, this enormous, the, the airport's one gaming arcade. The airport itself. And there are all these people. <laughs> it's just frightening. We've, we've lost. In one sense, we've lost it. And that's what, you know, what I heard this year, somebody wanted to put a gaming arcade in the center of Ireland. I just said, oh God, what are we doing? <laughs> we'll take one more question. Yeah? Do you, do you think we'll ever see um, the accountability like right here? Do you think we'll ever see real accountability for the Well, you know, I think we've, I see we've seen it. 
You're witnessing it. Bertie Ahern isn't in Oris and Lutheran today. That's accountability. When you think about that, and I, it's, I'm not making it, I'm not dumping on him, it, but I do think you're seeing accountability. But we're maybe seeing it in a totally different way. Because this guy told he was a shoe in you know, three years ago. It was just a coronation. I'll become, you know, I'll move from leader of Fianna Fáil to being Taoiseach for three times into the, um, into the Oris. So in a way, that is accountability. Uh, and I just think that, I think people have, you know, maybe they're not marching out in the streets, because I'm old-fashioned, oh, get out in the streets and that's where you do it, because that's what they did in the past. As I said, there were 100,000 people out for the tax marches in the, in the 70s and again in the 80s. Okay, it hasn't happened now. But I do think that we're having accountability. Did poor old Sean Gallagher have to do a bit of accounting as well during the... Uh... Well, I'm... Listen, that's too current. <laughs> but, um, uh, look, everything is, look, everything is accountable. When we get... Listen, I'm, I work for an organisation that in one sense has got, you know, something terribly wrong at the moment um, in relation to, you know, the whole prime time story. All I can say is that I know the people involved, the journalists involved, and, I, I, and you may not believe me, but I don't... Throughout all the time that I've been in RTE, people always say, I mean, the political system always says that, um, ah, you're out to get us. You know, you know there's such a shorthand, you know, you're, you're again either Fianna Fáil, you're against Labour, or you're against Fine Gael, or whatever, or even against Sinn Féin, because once, once the political system's there, they always believe that people are out to get them. But two things for me are important. One is that Orti is a microcosm, like it is in this group here today. People, there's nearly 2,000 people working in Orti at any one time. They come from all walks of life, from every town and village in Ireland, from every, every hamlet. And nobody wakes up every morning and says, I want to, we must get rid of Fianna Fáil today, we must get rid of Labour, we must get rid of this. People go and do their job. And um, here I'm going to be shamefaced and say that public service broadcasting or RTE is not about Brian Dobson, it's not about George Hamilton, or pick any name. In five years or in ten years' time, this country will still need a media that can probe and question. Got to be careful when we make mistakes, say we're sorry when we get it wrong, but you know, and it, it, the mistake can be enormous, but um, it might suit some politicians to say, oh, now we must get rid of RT, we must do something. But in my view, the public service broadcast is important and will continue to be important. America doesn't have it. By and large, public service broadcasting is dead in America, except for um, the PBS and um, public service radio and television, which are small, which are brilliant. But you know, I do believe that this country needs a system, but I think all of us need to be probing and to be questioning uh, so that we're not all led blindly the way we were in the past. Speaking of which, I believe you have an invitation. Oh yes, the program, by the way, is coming from um, <laughs> Saturday with Charlie Bird. But is actually coming from the Garter Lane Theatre here on Saturday afternoon. So if anybody wants to come along and sit in and watch it, you're very welcome. That's Charlie's radio program. Yeah, he's travelling around the country at the moment, kind of getting the mood. It's of a live people. show. A live show. So, so if you're, you're interested in coming along, being broadcast this Saturday afternoon from the Garter Lane Theatre. Yeah. What time do people need to be there? Yeah, about one o'clock, five past one. Okay, Charlie Bird, thank you very, very much.